This is the audio of the 2021 English 2 fall semester exam. There are two passages that will be read. The first one is called Alpha Alpha Gamma by Nancy Springer. The second one is Would You Risk Your Life to Save a Stranger by C. Tiger and P. Franks. The first passage, Alpha Alpha Gamma by Nancy Springer. I can't handle this, but Carrie Ellen did not say the words aloud, jammed into a Mini Cooper with four other college kids. She wouldn't let them know how shaky she felt as they pulled into church parking lot where the search and rescue command center was set up. To her friends, it was all new. The muddle of cop cars and ambulances and TV vans and tables and tents, the swarms of state troopers and sheriffs and borough officials and firefighters and volunteers, the blare of megaphones and the yammering of a helicopter overhead. But to Carrie Ellen, it was entirely too familiar. Even though, this time, the setting was not a ragged stretch of highway amid used car lots, storage lockers, furniture outlets, and fast food eateries, such as Burger King, such as the Burger King her sister had been walking to. This was a rich neighborhood. Here, Carrie Ellen looked around at McMansions bigger than barns, each with its own vast chem green lawn beneath forested hills nothing like the trailer park where she lived along Route 109. Yet, here were the search dogs and in their orange capelets, and the feelings were just the same as then. Deja vu, she murmured. I beg your pardon? asked a skinny boy with fat glasses. An archetypal nerd squashed against her in the back seat. Don't you mean deja vu? Whatever. Hadn't the dork ever heard of kung fu? Deja vu. She'd been kicked in the head like this before. It's been two years, get over it. The girl who was driving parked in the only available space on the grass and killed the motor. Geez, I didn't think there'd be so many people here. I thought they would have found her by now, said another sorority girl. She's, what, three years old? How far can she have gone? Unless somebody abducted her, said the nerd. Don't. Don't even think that word. It was way less painful to think what the cops had suggested at first, that Kimmy Sue was a runaway, even though anybody with the brain of a garden slug knew Kimmy wouldn't run away, especially not when she was walking to work in her Burger King uniform. No, it didn't matter what anybody said. They all knew Kimmy Sue, like so many others, had been snatched. But Carrie tried to tell herself it happened differently. That her sister had been kidnapped. Kidnappers kept people alive, didn't they? But say she's just wandered out off the house, gabbed the driver as she got out of the Mini Cooper. With difficulty, Carrie Ellen shifted her thoughts back to today's lost girl, not a teen but a toddler. Say she was out in the woods last night. It got down to almost to freezing. They think that if they find her today, she might not. So let's get moving. Carol Ann was startled to hear her own voice. Once out of her car, they strode a serpentine line between parking, parked pickup trucks, incoming traffic, and the women directing people where to park. Carrie stared numbly at dog handlers arriving with bloodhounds, church ladies with bringing bags of hamburger buns and crockpots of barbecue people carrying boxes of freshly pr printed flyers, Red Cross workers handing out coffee. Scanning the crowd, she realized she was looking for Kimmy, the way she always did, wherever she went, as if she might someday glimpse her sister at a shopping mall or a renaissance fair. Stop it! Redirected, her attention caught on a boy in a college basketball jacket. A gawky young man, jutting like a tall dead pine over the floodwater rush of activity. Burke, called one of the three sorority girls. Have they found anything? He focused, stunned eyes on the approaching group as if he didn't recognize them, even though he went to their post-game parties and he knew other commuters like Carrie from hanging out on the campus between classes. She saw Burke's throat shudder as he swallowed. It was his little sister, Bethany, who was lost. Anything? 
the girl asked again. He shook his head. His wooden gaze drifted down the stream of consciousness none of them could see, except Carrie. She knew how he felt. Stop thinking! She turned away from him. Volunteers, sign in here, said a hand-lettered poster over a table manned by two middle-aged guys in brown uniforms. The one who took their names gave instructions rapid fire. Down that path, he pointed to a hiking trail leading into the woods. When you get to where the ribbon stops, that's where you search. Three teams of two. No, wait. There are five of you. I'll go, said an unexpected voice. Carrie Ellen turned to find Burke by her side. I'm not doing any good here. The officer glanced at him, curt. Three teams of two spread out about six feet apart and, pay, and post these. He handed the girl in the front of the three ribbons. Go due east. He handed her three compasses. You should be almost shoulder to shoulder. Look all around, up, down, sideways, not just in front. If you find anything at all, a cigarette butt, a tire mark, a footprint, don't touch it. Shove one of these into the ground nearby. He gave her a few stakes of raw wood with orange plastic stapled to the top. Then go on. When you get to the highway, turn around and come back, due west. Keep looking in case you missed something the first time. When you get back to where you started, leave the ribbons to show where you searched and report here to me. Be safe and stay with your buddies. We don't need another missing person right now. Any questions? He scanned their faces but jolted to a halt when he saw Carrie Ellen. His voice changed completely. Aren't you the Spangler girl? Carrie Ellen hadn't expected this. She managed to nod. The cop took a deep breath. Young lady, I'm sorry about your sister, he said softly. I want you to know that we law officers haven't forgotten her. Not a day goes by that we don't follow up or try to think of a new angle, a way to find her. Something bleak and true was great in his gray gaze enabled Carrie to say, every night we light a candle for her, in a lantern outside the door, like, to bring her home. The policeman just nodded. Whatever it takes to keep going, huh? You're brave to be here today. Carrie Ellen couldn't acknowledge his comment. Well, good luck. Dismissed. Walking along the graveled hiking trail, Carrie studied the blue ribbons tied to the tree trunks and felt her friends eyeing her. Out of towners, they didn't know, and she wasn't going to explain. No one said anything until they reached the end of the ribbons, and just then they spoke only to pair off. Carrie found herself teamed, just her luck, with Burke. He stood there, lost in an abyss of self, trying to peer out of the world that made no sense, she knew. She tied their blue ribbon around the shagbark shag bark hickory. They headed into the woods. Oh, briars, complained one of the girls as they picked their way through the thorny edge. Suddenly, Burke broke his silence to call. Bethany! Carrie Ellen stiffened. Only echoes answered from between the trunks of tall pines. The gray and green twilight beneath the trees felt familiar. This place reminded Carrie of the woods near Grandpa's hunting cabin. Two little girls call, calling and giggling and playing hide-and-go-seek. Forests were full of good places to hide, always. Blinking around her at boulders, deadfalls, dying saplings, draped in kudzu vine. Carrie felt as if, Kimmy! Right here, somewhere. Stop it, she scolded herself. Stop, feeling, don't, think, instead. She started scanning up, down, sideward, between trees, behind rocks, under fallen trunks. Bethany, Burke called. Carrie bit her lip. The skinny boy with fat glasses asked, Burke, weren't you the last one who saw her? Right, in a sinking voice waterlogged. I was babysitting her. You were watching a movie or something? Right. What was your sister doing? Who did this nerd think he was? A grief therapist? Heaving a fallen branch out of her way with more than necessary force, Carrie almost told him to shut up. But suddenly, Burke started talking as if he wanted to. Little brat, she was just hanging around, pestering. I was watching The Born Ultimatum, like I just bought the DVD. And Bethy was in and out of the room. I wasn't paying much attention. Anyway, when the movie was over, I went looking for her. It was past her bedtime. I figured she'd fallen asleep on the sofa or someplace, like she usually did. A long silence followed, broken by crashing sounds as if they made their way slow, their, their slow way around rocks and brush. Carrie saw blood root in bloom. She saw fern fiddleheads, turkey tail bracket fungus, 
and tiny mushrooms growing day glow orange, like a search dog's uniform in a rotting log. She did not see any sign of the lost little girl. The skinny guy asked, was the house door open or anything? Nope, Burke's voice wobbled. I don't get it. I just don't get it. I'd swear she couldn't go out of the house. I mean, she never did before. But you looked everywhere. Under beds, in closets, in the attic, the swimming pool, all of the shower stalls, the jacuzzi, the toy chest, both of the freezers and refrigerators. My parents came home and looked. Then the cops looked. One of the girls asked, are your parents pissed at you? I, I really don't know. They're too freaked out to even talk to me. Oh, I'm sorry. The skinny boy said, there's something white. No, it's just flowers. Damn. Bert called with a wilderness, Bethany! Back at the volunteer's desk, they turned in the wood stakes, as well as the compasses. They hadn't found a thing. They had not found a thing. They uttered platitudes to Burke. Well, um, good luck. Yeah, hang in there. Things have got to get better. He barely nodded, all alone in the sea of people. Carrie Ellen wished that he could think of something to say, something to let him know she understood how he felt, which she did, probably better than anybody else. But forget it. Even more, she just wanted to get the heck out, to get the heck away. Good. The girl who drove the Mini Cooper was ready to head out, car keys in hand. Um, thanks for trying, guys. Burke's voice had gone wooden again. The skinny boy asked suddenly, Burke, would you show us where Bethany was the last time you saw her? Oh no. What was it with the nerd? He had some kind of detective complex. Um, sure. Burke seemed surprised, but more alive. Why not? Come on. He led the way. Sighing, trailing behind, Carrie looked around, feeling the scorn of the have-nots toward the haves. How could four people possibly require so much space? Burke's barn-sized house echoed like a cavern. Of course, there was nobody home. Burke's parents were busy in the command center. The posters, the radio, the TV reporters. Carrie Ellen knew, it what, knew how it was. But, not, but even on an ordinary day, this place would have felt like an underbooked hotel. Burke told them, through a living room the size of a gymnasium, and the past of the formal dining room, a decorative downstairs bathroom, and a white, gleaming kitchen, then along a wide corridor. Above her head, on a sort of indoor balcony, Carrie Ellen glimpsed a crawl-in space, a crawl-in plastic playhouse with a doll perched in on its pink roof. Hastily, she looked away, following Burke down the curving stairs to a family room. Way in the back of the house, as far as possible from its gracious spaces, this was the windowless den apparently meant for turning up the volume. Carrie saw a huge entertainment system, the vast plasma screen, HDTV, stereo CD, and DVD players, racks of discs to choose from, five speakers positioned around the room, lush, velvety, cream-colored carpeting and oversized cushy sofas. Wow, she said, the three sorority girls in unison. Carrie Owen said nothing. What a great place to watch a movie, said the girl with the Mini Cooper, gazing around with a hungry look. The skinny boy asked, where did you sit? Noisy nerd, would he never run out of questions? Bert pointed out to a massive armchair that matched the sofas. I would have wanted to stretch out, said the movie hungry girl. I was stretched out, Bert, nodding at the hulking chairs, its cushion bulk flush with the carpet. That's a recliner. It is? It doesn't look like one. Damn it, stop yapping. I just want to... Without warning, Deja Fu kicked in, Grandpa's hunting cabin, rambling and as full of hidey holes as all the woods around it, root cellar, pantry, kitchen table with oil cloth hanging neatly, or excuse me, nearly, to the cracked linoleum floor, shabby old recliners in front of the rabbit ear TV, two little girls, Carrie and Kimmy, pestering and giggling and crawling. That's a recliner. Open it. Carrie Ellen yelled, darting toward the chair. Burke, open it. Her shout made him leap to obey, even though his face remained a petrified blank. Gently, carefully, Carrie ordered, flopping over the belly in front of the chair. But I don't think, Bert bent over the lever. Slowly, the footrest lifted up. I don't think she'd fit, trying not to hope. But Carrie Ellen ached with hope. You got so... 
you got so you hoped for some sort of ending, anything, even if it was for coyotes to dig up the body and scatter the bones enough that some hunter found something. Oh God, please. She could not see in the darkness beneath the chair, not at all. But then she heard the wail of a toddler awakened from an exhausted sleep. Bethany! Burke yelled on his belly side and Carrie Ellen. Oh my God, Bethy! He drew the little girl out from under the chair, sitting up to hold her in his lap and hug her. She was crying. So was he. Why didn't I think of that? Said the detective-minded nerd. She fell asleep under there, and when the movie was over, you cranked it down to get up, and ever since then, everybody has been in the attic or outside or someplace looking for her. Carrie saw Bethy's small, petal-soft face dewed with tears, a flower alive and unharmed. Carrie sprang to her feet, whooped out loud, clapped her hands, and jumped wildly on the thick, creamy carpeting. The others jumped and screamed with her. With, Beth, with little Bethany in his arms, Burke got up and ran, taking the stairs two at a time, heading outside to tell his mother and father and the cops in the world, We found her! He started yelling long before he reached the front door. Look, she's all right! We found her! Carrie danced in a circle around the recliners. The others clapped, cheered. Carrie Ellen tilted her head back and laughed and laughed. Raw, wrenching grief surged up from her chest, grief that two years hadn't managed to dull, grief just as a streak knife, sharp as ever. Faltering to a halt, she hid her face behind her hands and sobbed like a baby, pulling away when the sorority girls tried to put their arms around her, for she belonged to a different sort of sorority, a lonely sorority, its members scattered and mute, its letters Alpha Alpha Gamma, all the abducted girls. My sister, Carrie wept, my sister, oh my God, my sister, my sister. Would you risk your life to save a stranger? By C. Tiger and P. Franks. Dina Leal was on her way to work when her mother phoned. Did you see the news? Her mom asked breathlessly. No, what happened? A baby was kidnapped from a shopping center in Abilene yesterday. Stretched right in front of the, snatched right in front of the family's car. What? Dina exclaimed. Reading from the news bulletin across the TV screen, Dina's mother repeated, Officials ask residents to be on alert. One month old baby girl is abducted from Walmart parking lot. The two women were shocked. Dina's mother, by the cruelty of the crime, Dina because she thought she might actually know who did it. The previous afternoon, August 13, 2002, Dina, the assistant director of nurses at a nursing home in Quanah, Texas, had been pulled aside by Sherry Campbell, one of her co-workers who had big news. Sherry's daughter, Paula Roach, had called to her to tell her mother that she had just given birth. After happily relaying the news to fellow staffers, Sherry jumped into her car to drive to nearby Abilene, where she planned to pick up Paula and her baby girl. But Dina was more disturbed than delighted by Sherry's announcement. Sherry's daughter had been claiming to be pregnant for at least a year. Dina hadn't seen Paula for a while, so perhaps she was telling the truth, but Dina doubted it. She suspected Paula wasn't pregnant, and never had been. And since this wasn't the kind of lie you could easily back out of, sometimes Dina had wondered how Paula was going to end it. Now, on this hot morning, she had a terrible feeling that she had just found out. Worried, Dina called the nursing home to see if anyone had seen her abducted child story on the news. The nurse who picked up the phone said she had that poor mother then added that sherry paula and the new baby were visiting the nursing home and dina should hurry if she wanted to see them tell them to wait i'm on my way dina spoke with forced enthusiasm as she hung up her hunch could have been wrong but she didn't think so and she certainly wasn't going to risk letting paula disappear with another woman's baby after a first after a fast call to the town sheriff she jumped into her car and raced off to Quana nursing home Joining the group she had gathered, Dina congratulated Paula, who smiled as proudly as any new mother would. Reaching out for her baby, Dina had a quick assessment and her heart began to pound. This infant was no newborn. She was big enough to be a month old. Dina discreetly ran her hand over the child's belly, looking for the umbilical cord stump. There was no trace of it, though it usually takes weeks to drop off, and Paula didn't look like a woman fresh from giving birth. She was dearly nervous, and her eyes kept darting toward the door. Dear Lord, Dina thought, I hope the cops hurry. Softly, she began murmuring and the, appro the appropriate things. 
that this was such a darling baby, such a sweet baby. Dina's plan was to stall for time, so she worked to keep up stream of chatter, but the small talk soon faded. Now Paula was tugging the baby out of Dina's arms. She was leaving the building with her mother in tow. Dina was frantic, but didn't think that she could stop them. Fortunately, someone did. As Sherry and Paula left the parking lot, Sheriff Randy Akers pulled Sherry's car over. Inside, he saw a baby, a perfect match for the missing child. Paula was arrested and charged with one count of aggravated kidnapping. Just a few hours later, one-month-old Nancy Crystal Chavez was reunited with her parents, Margarita and Salvador Chavez. Watching the family later on TV, Dina learned that Margarita had tried desperately to hang onto her baby through the window of Paula's car, but Paula had just sped away, dragging Mar Margarita halfway across the asphalt parking lot and covering her body with cuts and bruises. Dina, who has four kids of her own, cried softly as she watched the reunited family. I just felt so wonderful, she says, to help this story have a happy ending. Missing child, Manny Vargas, age 10, sex, male, race, Hispanic, hair brown, eyes brown, weight 105 pounds, missing from Sayreville, missing since October 17, 2008, details, unknown clothing description. Sayreville Police Department, Sergeant Rich Slattery, 732-555-5426.